now. Oh my, are we doing it in all different orders? Uh, are you starting? Yeah, the chief's going to go on after you and set up uh, the video. Okay, but you start first, right? Yeah, I start first. Okay, go. Video, I think it's fine. The welcome video. You know. I think we're fine. It's just we used to do it every other week, but now it's been over a year, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Simon, are we ready? Okay, good to go. All right, welcome everybody to the New York State Psychiatric Institute New Employee Orientation. Uh, a lot of what we're going to go over today has to do with um, keeping each other safe while we're in the workplace. Um, uh, we're going to have a welcome video that's going to explain the dynamics of um, this institute. We'll also have an employee assistance program announcement. Uh, I'll go over the mission and vision a little bit, as well as suicide prevention. And then our infection control nurse, Alicia Crow, is going to go over infection control with you. And our chief of safety, Lee Golson, is going to go over fire safety, right to know, domestic and workplace violence prevention. And then I'll go over um, HIPAA, PD, uh, the PDF review with of all the... Re PDFs that we sent you, and Institute Policies, Sexual and Workplace Harassment and Language Access. So we'll get started with the uh, new employee orientation video. Welcome to the New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia Psychiatry. I am happy that you have chosen to work here and I would like to give you a brief introduction of our complex institution, as well as an understanding of our vision, mission, and values. In total, we employ approximately 1,500 full and part-time employees who are paid by New York State Office of Mental Health, OMH, the Research Foundation of Mental Hygiene, RFMH, or Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. There are an additional 1,000 volunteers and students who work here at the Institute. Employees are organized in various academic, clinical, research, administrative, and supportive units. The units are overseen by the Executive Director, who reports to the Commissioner of OMH, through the OMH Medical Director. The Director of the Institute also serves as the Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons and as a Psychiatrist-in-Chief at the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Most of our professional staff members hold faculty appointments in the Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. PI and Columbia have a long-standing affiliation agreement that began in 1926 when the Psychiatric Institute moved to the Columbia campus so that the Institute staff can conduct their research in close contact with other scientists in the academic medical center setting. Through our affiliation agreement, Columbia paid employees can work side by side with OMH and RFMH employees to teach and conduct research, creating a uniquely successful public-private partnership in academic medicine. PI occupies space in several different buildings. However, most of PI staff and programs are housed in two OMH buildings, connected by a bridge over Riverside Drive, Parties, and Kolb. We also lease space, two floors in the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health over at Audubon, and an outpatient clinic just up north in the Inwood section of Manhattan. In addition to our own space, our faculty members are responsible for running the psychiatric inpatient unit, outpatient offices, and emergency department at the New York Presbyterian Hospital. And they participate in a large Columbia University-run faculty practice program on this campus and in Midtown. The Institute's activities are funded by a combination of state appropriation for staff lines, building infrastructure, and support and other administrative services, and public and private research grants. Most of the grants are federally funded through National Institute of Health. The majority of grants are administered and overseen by the Research Foundation for Mental Hygiene, and the rest through Columbia University. The Research Foundation for Mental Hygiene, Incorporated, is a private, not-for-profit membership corporation organized in 1952 for the purpose of assisting and enhancing the research and training objectives 
of the New York State Department of Mental Hygiene and its component agencies, i.e. the Office of Mental Health. Through an agreement with New York State, RFMH has been designated as the organization responsible for administering and directing the conduct of all sponsored research programs carried out by scientists at the Institute. The New York State Psychiatric Institute, affectionately known as PI, is the nation's oldest psychiatric research institute. Starting in 1896, the institution has been a leader in advancing our understanding of mental illness since its founding. Research at NYSPI involves basic, translational, and clinical science, including major efforts to identify abnormal genes that may predispose to psychiatric illness, to identify and test new pharmacological psychotherapeutic treatments, to learn about childhood precursors of mental disorders, and to understand basic molecular functions of the human brain. While we are primarily a research facility, we provide a range of clinical services at PI and at our affiliated institutions. In addition, we train hundreds of students and volunteers each year. PI has residency training programs in adult, child, forensic, substance abuse, and public psychiatric and multiple clinical and research fellowships and intern externships in psychology, social work, nursing, and other allied professionals. Our clinical research and training services are synergistic and are all important in our efforts to be a premier academic psychiatry department and research institution. As a state facility, PI is part of a multi-hospital system under the direction of the New York State Office of Mental Health and is one of only two research institutions charged by the state with the responsibility to conduct research to improve the mental health of its citizens. Our highly integrated PI, Columbia Department of Psychiatry, is widely viewed as one of the foremost academic and research centers in psychiatry in the world. For the last seven years, we have received more grant income from NIH than any other psychiatric research program in the United States. Together, NYSPI and Columbia have diagnosed and treated thousands of patients, educated and trained generations of scientists, clinicians, and administrators in a range of mental health disciplines in New York and around the world. Such efforts require sharing and coordinating of commitment, resources, and staff towards these common goals. We have included a copy of our vision, mission, and value statement in your packet. Please take a few moments at your leisure to review it. Welcome to the PI family. Okay, so you'll be able to get those mission and vision um, uh, pamphlets in your folder when you come to pick it up. We'll have a number at the end of this uh, where you can call to arrange to um, pick up your packet and get your safety card. Um, our employee assistance program is here to help you in all areas. So our employee uh, assistance program coordinator is Dana Moore and you can uh, email her at this email address or call her at our extension. If there's anything that you need help with, our employee assistance program is here to um, uh, help you with health, wellness, family planning, uh, in anything that you need assistance for. They, they're a referral service um, that, that is able to help you in those areas. Uh, employee assistance program also has a fitness center and um, when that reopens, uh, you'll be able to call uh, Claudia Raman or email her uh, in order to take the orientation to be able to utilize the um, uh, facilities fitness center. Uh, the employee assistance program also does several, several other programs here at the Institute. Um, there are Plum Benefits, which um, is a benefit program that allows you discounts for a lot of different events. Um, Frontline Employees is a newsletter um, that they send out. And they also have uh, several different uh, webinars and WebEx on, on several different events. And you'll see those emails uh, when you're working here. Um, so do try to take advantage of the Employee Assistance Program. It's one of the um, most underutilized programs and it's real, we're really here to uh, help you uh, and make life less complicated.
okay? So uh, getting a little back into our mission and, and key values, uh, of course, we have research here, we have clinical care here, and we have education here, and we wanna make sure that they're all coordinated and that the research here that we do here at the Institute is translational and it, and it moves over into clinical care quickly. Uh, some of our key values are, you know, passion and dedication. We want to show the person that we're working with, uh, you know, that they matter. And we'll get into the respect policy later and being uh, respectful of all people and being professional and striving for excellence and encouraging innovation and acting with integrity and honesty. And, you know, of course, accountability and trust. We want to make sure that reporting adverse events that happen. And, you know, I always use the analogy that, you know, if there's a, a puddle on the floor, one person slips on it, doesn't say anything, and the next person twists an ankle or breaks a wrist, um, that could have been prevented. So it's important, and we want to encourage all staff here and new employees included uh, to, to report anything that's going on either in the facility or in your department so that we can continue to improve um, uh, what we're doing here. Uh, we don't want to push something that's not working, and we definitely don't want to encourage um, um, things that aren't safe uh, for people, uh, either in the workplace or the people that we serve. Um, and some of the places that you can, of course, uh, you won't be expected to know all of the departments immediately, but you can report to your supervisor and your team, or you can ask them who to report to. Um, this is an organizational chart that, you know, um, that talks about the different departments, and it shows you, you know, from the leadership uh, down to, you know, quality management and our facility administrators. Um, they're all parts of several different teams and meetings uh, that, that look at how we can uh, continuously improve um, what we do here at, at NISPI. Um, the uh, institutional internets also have forms where you can report things. Uh, the service net is the main, um, you know, intranet for NYSPI, and there is the IRB website, and there's also a Department of Comparative Medicine website. Uh, this is the service net homepage where the accident and incident forms uh, can be found uh, to report accidents and incidents that you that you have here. Um, and our clinical services are provided on, on 4 South, which is our community services uh, unit, and then 4 Center. It, they usually do um, eating disorder um, uh, research there on that unit, and 5 South usually does substance use, but also other um, uh, psychiatric research on that unit. There's the child day unit. There's the, um, um, the, the psychiatric intern residency clinic, and there's the research outpatient clinic, outpatient clinics. Um, at, as, you know, um, was mentioned in the video earlier in Inwood and in Auto, on Audubon. So some of the research areas that we have are, um, they're vast, and, and it goes, you know, everything from early development to Alzheimer's, and it's continuously changing. Um, you know, again, as mentioned in the video before, we there's you know a, a lot of research that goes on here in many different areas, and um, you'll you'll find that out as you work here. Um, of course, confidentiality is key. You're responsible for keeping confidentiality uh, in in your area. You should only be sharing it on the on a need to know basis for treatment, billing, or operations, and outside of your area, you need a signed consent to share information. Um, so, you, you know, you have to protect uh, patient confidentiality. Uh, it's a responsibility of you while you work here, no matter what department or where you're working. Um, New York Office of Mental Health is doing a, a suicide prevention, a zero suicide initiative, where we want to do everything we can to reduce suicide. And everyone uh, working here has a responsibility uh, you know, whether it's like making sure you're not leaving cords laying around or other things, uh, you know, because our research patients do walk through the facility and we want to make sure that we're not leaving anything dangerous. Um, inpatient suicides, 75% uh, of them are usually uh, done through ligatures and that's, um, you know, somebody tying something onto something else and being able to um, utilize that um, to, to carry out a suicidal ideation. So we wanna make sure that we're looking um, at reducing ligature risk um, and everything that we can do to, you know, like changing these out for the plastic handles uh, or, um, you know, looking, everything that the organization has to conduct um, a, a risk assessment. So we, we look through um, the units, the inpatient units, and we try to determine where those risks are. Um, some of the places that they found were on the, the doorways 
in different places that, that could be used um, for ligatures uh, in the restrooms and um, the day room door, uh, day room furniture, um, hallway, hall, um, blind spot dorm rooms. So um, some of the things that we do is any patient that's, that is a high risk, they determine risk with the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. And then if they are a high risk, um, they are put on a one-to-one -one or you know by behaviors that they, they um, observe. And uh, they do 15-minute patient checks uh, to make sure that they're checking in on all the patients, not just the patients that are on one-to-one. -one. And then there are observations of the day room. They have staff uh, there watching them, and observation of the dormitories uh, and the soft-locking doors, and observation of mirrors for blind spots, and admission search for removal of li any ligature risk or anything that could be potentially danger dangerous. Um, if you're working with patients, even in the, you know, especially in the outpatient um, uh, facilities, it's, you know, right after, um, you know, outpatient is a high risk, especially um, right after discharge, but 90 days after discharge is a high risk time for, for patients because now they have access uh, uh, to the ability at, uh, uh, to you know, um, carry out suicide. So they they look at a few different things when they when they talk about suicide prevention. And, and you know, one sense of belonging, one is their their desire and their ability to do it. Um, and, you know, so you have to be looking at all these things. And if you uh, want training in these areas, Center for Practice Innovations has a lot of uh, good trainings, and um, you know, in developing um, risk plans for your for your patients, whether they're inpatients or outpatients. And um, you know, of course, everyone encourages using the suicide uh, risk lines because you know they're available 24/7. Uh, there's also a, a suicide text crisis line that OMH has partnered with, and they encourage people to use that. So if you are um, uh, working with patients, outpatients, or even research uh, as a as a research assistant, you want to make sure that you uh, you know have these numbers and things available to offer um, the the people that we serve. Um, and again, educate yourself. Uh, do your best to try to learn um, how to develop uh, good, good safety plans for your patients. Um, up next is going to be our um, infection control nurse, Alicia Carreau, and uh, she's going to talk to you guys about all the new developments in infection control. Thank you, Marshall. Hi, I'm Alicia Carreau. Um, so I'll go briefly through the highlights of what we need to know to continue to keep each other safe here at PI in regard to infection control. Um, so first of all, we don't want you to come to work at all if you have any signs or symptoms of illness. There is the online screening, the red cap screening, which needs to be done each day. Um, if you are ill, inform your supervisor and your HR department. If you're test positive, please contact me. I, in addition to my usual email, Alicia Kuro, there is an infection control email. We want you to wear a surgical mask at all times, except when you're alone in your office. Maintain physical distance when possible. Perform hand hygiene well and often. These are the three most important things you can do to stay safe during this COVID pandemic. And it's protecting against a lot of other infectious illnesses. When you're interacting with outpatient participants or if you are in the inpatient units, anywhere a patient can be, in addition, you need to wear eye protection, so goggles or a face shield. So if you were to receive a positive test, you need to quarantine a minimum of 10 days. Additionally, if you have any symptoms, your symptoms need to be much improved and you need to be without a fever without taking any medication that reduces your fever before you return on site. If you were to have an exposure, um, there's questions sometimes about what exposure means. Exposure is direct, prolonged, close contact without PPE. So it's not your child's classmate was positive. So that would not be an exposure to you. Direct contact, um, prolonged more than 10 minutes and close within six feet and either tested positive or you find out had tested positive just after. And you have to not be wearing PPE. So if you're interacting with uh, uh, the person, it's just not wearing a face mask. If you're on an inpatient area or in the outpatient uh, clinic area, you, that additionally you would need the eye protection. And if there's uh, you're 
performing an aerosol generating procedure, then you need the full PPE of gown, gloves, eye protection, and respirator. So if people are adhering to our strict policies of keeping people safe and wearing appropriate PPE, then no exposure can take place at work. So if you did have an exposure and you are asymptomatic, you don't have any symptoms, these are the work restrictions. Now, again, these, these updates keep changing. Um, CDC and OMH guidelines we follow, and uh, there are often changes. So, um, but currently, if you are fully vaccinated, but you have had an exposure, but you have no symptoms, you can return to work immediately, and we ask you to test with five to seven days after the exposure. If you have recovered from a confirmed COVID-19 illness within the past three months, you can return to work immediately, but there is no testing requirement. If you are unvaccinated or not recovered from a confirmed COVID-19 case within the last three months, quarantine for 10 days. Domestic travel. So this has recently changed. So there are no quarantine and no testing requirements after domestic travel, and that is both for vaccinated and unvaccinated staff. International travel, travel differs. Travel is not, international travel is not advised. If you choose to travel, you need to discuss this with your supervisor because you need to put into account for your, your time away from work will need to include a quarantine. So both vaccinated and unvaccinated staff are required to receive a, so there are two ways. You can receive a negative test prior to uh, leaving your international location. And then upon return to New York, it's a seven day quarantine and you need to test between day three and day five. If you choose not to test, then it's a 10 day quarantine. So it's a minimum of additional seven days to 10 days on top of whatever vacation time you are um, requesting. Patient or participant screening. So our outpatients are screened again using this red cap online screening prior to their appointment and again they are screened at the entrance. Outpatient participants are escorted by staff. Inpatient participants need to be COVID PCR tested and negative prior to coming in. In the research section, this is done within a week uh, in outpatient. There used to be a delay in turnaround time for obtaining PCR results, and now we're getting uh, results within 24 hours from Nathan Klein. Patients, clinical patients that are coming in come through the ER, and they are all tested for COVID prior to arriving at PI. So outpatient participants that come in will have a repeat PCR and day of admission. Just a Go over again, if you're outpatient coming in, you're tested prior to getting here, you're tested again on the day you arrive. If you're a clinical patient coming in, you're tested in the ER just prior to coming here. Then everybody, once they're on their unit, everyone is, uh, all patients are maintained on a 24 hour quarantine. And that's uh, where you're monitoring for any signs and symptoms of illness. And all inpatients are tested for antibodies. And again, all inpatients are tested PCR within 72 hours prior to discharge. Hand hygiene, it's simple and it is so effective. So best way to prevent infection. Hand hygiene is with soap and water or with the alcohol-based sanitizer. You do need to use soap and water after toileting before eating and when your hands are visibly soiled. You need to wash your hands for 20 seconds, which is much longer than most people are doing. So next time you wash your hands, count. Alcohol-based sanitizer, it's just rub until dry. Now you can use the alcohol-based sanitizer or soap and water before and after every patient contact and immediately after removing gloves. Occupational exposures, if you have an exposure, this is if you get stuck by a needle, if you get stuck with a broken slide glass, if you have a, you're working in the lab and the chemical splashes in your face, if you are working with an animal and you get bitten or scratched. All of these are occupational exposures. You need to immediately report. You, you should always have a supervisor in house and you need to immediately report to your supervisor. We want you to clean the area very well with soap and water. Staff that work in DCM, Department of Comparative Medicine, there are specific protocols for um, in the area they're working of how to clean after an exposure. If you were to have an exposure to your eyes, you clean with water 
or saline. Many of the labs in the treatment rooms on the inpatient units do have um, eye flush stations. We want to notify safety. 5100 is the main number. Somebody will pick up. Safety will notify either myself. If I'm here, I generally work Monday through Friday on the day shift or the nurse on call. There is always a nurse on call. So either the NOC or myself will come and meet you to assist you with any of the um, steps that you need to go through. All employees then are, it's requested that you go to the ER. If you, want, if you were to use a prophylaxis medication, it is recommended to start within just a few hours, two hours even after an exposure. Um, and again, people please report, report exposures and accidents. People don't get in trouble for reporting exposures or accidents. What we want to do is look at what happened and what could we put in place so this will not happen again. And even at the ER, nobody's going to make you take, anti, uh, the, take the prophylactic medication or any treatment. They'll, they'll make an evaluation and then they'll give you a recommendation and then you decide what you want to do. Need to have you complete an accident report. The accident reports are located on the service net. And again, safety or the NOC or myself or probably your supervisor also, we can always help you with completing that online report. Waste, uh, we have sharps containers, red bags, and regular trash. Sharps containers, this is for anything that's sharp, um, used or unused, because if there's a, even if it's a clean needle and it's in the trash, the environmental services doesn't know if that's clean or not. So anything sharp goes in a sharp container, and that includes any glass uh, slides, things like that. Red bag, uh, what I have there, pathological specimens, animal waste, carcasses. This is for items that are soaked, caked, or dripping with blood. This does not include urine, fecal, reg gloves, your gauze with a little piece of, a little drop of blood on it, your Band-Aid that's used, um, the adult diapers. None of that goes in red bag unless it's so soaked, caked, or dripping with blood. Regular trash, so that's where everything else goes. Universal precautions in PPE, so face masks. Of course, face masks are to be worn at all times. When you enter the building, we want you to be wearing a surgical face mask. You can always take a clean face mask at the front desk, but security at the entrance of Kolb or Pardes. Um, there are N95 masks. They are for clinical staff that are working with known COVID positive cases or when staff that are working uh, in ECT because that is an aerosol producing procedure. Gloves are to be worn whenever there's a possible risk of contact with blood or body fluids. Gloves do not replace hand hygiene. Please do not walk around with gloves on. It gives you a full sense that your hands are clean. You should touch the buttons, touch the doorknobs, touch the lights, clean your hands in between after you touch something. Goggles or face shields, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, this is when there's, um, when you're working with Participants in the outpatient, you're interacting for a period of time within, a, within six feet or anywhere on the inpatient units where a patient can be, um, can be located. In addition, of course, pipetting blood or any lab experiments where you have a risk of splashing a substance into your eyes, you should wear goggles or a face shield. Supersanic cloths, these are very effective bad, uh, against bacteria, viruses, blood. Work. Kill time is two minutes. That's a question that always comes up with Joint Commission. Clean your area, clean your equipment, in between contact by others, and daily. It's recommended to use gloves when you use these super sanic cloths because they can be quite harsh on your skin. Flu vaccination and TB testing. So flu vaccination is a standard of care. If you receive vaccination outside, please submit your record. We have to report compliance rates to OMH and Joint Commission. All patient admissions need to be screened for flu vaccination, and if they have not received it, offered a flu vaccination. Um, TB screening is an annual requirement. There is a change with TB, uh, TB testing screening. Of course, coming in as a new employee, everybody needs to have the two-step uh, TB test or the quantiferin gold blood test, but once you are here, the annual testing is no longer required unless you have had an exposure or you work in a high risk area. But it is still required annual screening. So I'll send out um, 
a screening report and everyone does need to screen. And again, for those working in the high risk area like DCM, um, we do continue doing TB testing biannually. So in conclusion, stay home if you're ill, wear a face mask, wear eye protection, get vaccinated against COVID and flu, and get vaccinated against, oh, I have, I'm sorry, COVID and flu. So this is our newer slide. We have started vaccinations now in New York. Vaccinations are open to everyone 16 and up. And if you were to have a positive COVID test or COVID exposure or travel quarantine, please let me know at the infection control website. Act immediately if you have an accident or an exposure. Dispose of your sharps properly. Clean your area. And again, TB will be a screening every year, except for those that work in high-risk areas. They'll continue to require TB testing. If you have any questions, contact me at Infection Control um, or my email. And welcome to PI. OK, I, up next is uh, Safety and Chief Golson. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lee Golson, Chief Safety and Security Officer here at NYSPI. I'm here to talk to you about security, safety, and fire safety here at the Institute. We have various security sensitive areas. One of those areas are our inpatient units where card access is required. Another area is, our, is the pharmacy. At the pharmacy area, we have card access. Only staff assigned to the pharmacy can enter the pharmacy. We have ph uh, card access, we have video cameras, and we have an alarm. If someone breaches security in the pharmacy, an alarm comes to the safety department and the safety officer is instructed to notify the New York S City Police Department. Another security sensitive area is our animal housing and research areas where we have card access and video cameras on those areas. Only staff assigned to the animal housing and research areas should enter the animal housing and research areas. Medical rec records, our substance abuse, same security setup that we have in the pharmacy. We have an alarm that goes to the uh, safety department and safety officer will instruct, are instructed to notify the New York City Police Department. And we also have video cameras in that area. Another security sensitive area is our S-level computer room, where again, we have card access and alarm that notify the New York City Police Department, telecommunications, and the MRI. MRI is more for your safety. If you enter the MRI with a ferrous object, it could be drawn from your hand and create a projectile effect, potentially injuring yourself and others. So only staff trained in MRI safety should enter the MRI, which is located on our S-level down in our basement area of the parties building. Basic security awareness, wear your IDs at all time once you're here. Uh, typically, we have 2,000 employees. Of course, uh, now during COVID, we have a reduced staffing level, but we can't possibly know everyone in the building for your safety and everyone else's safety. Please wear your IDs at all times once issued. Please safeguard your keys and access cards. Once you're given keys and access cards, Make sure you safeguard them. Report any suspicious activity. If you see anyone suspicious in your area, please call 5555 and immediately notify the safety and security department. Report any locks or card access points that aren't working to the safety department and to the maintenance department. Security risk mitigation, this is a hospital. If there's a psychiatric emergency in your area, Call 5555, and the uh, procedure is safety department will activate the psychiatric emergency plan, we'll make an overhead announcement, and we'll page the DOC or chief resident and page the nurse on call, and we'll respond to your location and offer assistance after making an overhead announcement. 
Another security risk is theft. Theft tends to be unattended property. Please safeguard your property, lock your doors, and make sure you secure your valuables at all times. If you are a victim of a theft, please immediately notify the safety department. Another security risk is threats, criminal harassment. If someone calls you and threatens you in the workplace, please immediately notify the safety department and we'll investigate and take appropriate action if necessary. We have four types of workplace violence and we have ways of mitigating each type of workplace violence. One type of workplace violence is intruder violence. We have security uh, station at all the entries and exits, uh, the primary exit entries points where staff come in. We have uh, also video cameras and alarms to try to reduce the risk of intruder uh, workplace violence, patient or subject workplace violence. Staff are trained in patient uh, management crisis skills. And we also have a psychiatric emergency plan that staff are trained to activate if a patient uh, threatens uh, other patients or an employee with workplace violence. Coworker violence. If you have an issue with one of your coworkers, please immediately notify your supervisor to attempt to intervene. If necessary, notify your human resources department. Notify the safety department if you feel threatened by a coworker. Domestic violence, those tend to be the most sensitive, but they can be the most potentially dangerous. If you're threatened by someone, you're a significant other, uh, please don't hesitate to notify your supervisor and notify the safety security department. If you have an, a restraining order, give us a copy of the restraining order so we'll attempt to uh, keep the person from entering the building. If you have a recent photograph, please provide us with a recent photograph so we can attempt to keep the person from entering the facility. Some risk factors, if you're treating a high risk uh, subject or patient and you're interviewing the person alone, you should notify a colleague so that you're not isolated with the person. Uh, confronting someone who's angry or violent, if you're confronting a research subject or an outpatient, please notify the safety department so we could be there to support you. Uh, enforcement activities, anytime you have to enforce a rule on any of the inpatient units or any your subjects or patients, a person could be potentially violent. So please notify your staff members so that you can have colleagues on hand to support you when you're uh, performing an enforcement activity. And how would you report workplace violence? Emergency, call 5555. Non-emergency, speak with your supervisor in writing and explain what your concerns are. Workplace violence forms could be found on our intranet. Active shooter, uh, if we do have an active shooter event, the first thing you should do is run and get out of that situation as quickly as you can and hide and find cover. You know, difference between cover and concealment, cover would be this podium. It may stop a projectile, a bullet. Uh, concealment would be just this flag wrapping it around me. You know, person may not see me, but it, you, you could still be injured and wounded from a projectile. So make sure that you have cover. Uh, and if necessary, if you're cornered and you have other people surrounding you, throw objects, try to fight, try to distract the person. Um, of course, immediately call 911 and allow and notify the New York City Police Department and then call 5555, let the safety department know. We have over 100 cameras in this building, close to 100 cameras in the other building. We'll try to uh, pull up the, your, the location of the shooter and so we will notify the police department when they come on the scene and give them what they call situation awareness so that they know what the situation is and be able to try to neutralize that shooter as quickly as possible. And once safety is notified, we'll make an overhead announcement. If you hear active shooter, please get into a safe area, lock yourselves in and remain there until the police department notifies you or the safety department gives an all clear sign. Now we'll switch gears, we'll talk about the right to know law. 
what the right to know law is, is that you have a right to request information about any toxic chemical here at the workplace. Chemical information could be found on safety data sheets. If you have concerns about any hazardous chemical in your work area, you can speak with your supervisor and the New York State Labor Law says within 72 hours, your supervisor must respond and give you the exact hazard that that chemical poses and provide you with a copy of that safety data sheet. Copies of safety data sheets could be found on the website, but the supervisor should instruct you and at least tell you where you can find those safety data sheets. If you have concerns about a workplace chemical hazard, your supervisor cannot retaliate or respond and terminate you or in your internship because you've made a reasonable request under the New York State Right to Know Law. Uh, violations of the Right to Know Law can be uh, reported to New York State Department of Labor. You can go to the website, you can uh, make your complaint in writing, or you can call the New York State Department of Labor and they'll send investigators down and investigate your concerns regarding the Right to Know Law. We also have a right to know officer who is Dr. Matias Quick. If you have any um, concerns or you want information about our right to know program or about any hazardous chemical here in the workplace, please don't hesitate to first speak with your supervisor. And if you're not satisfied, contact Matias Quick and Dr. Quick will be able to assist you. Now we talk about accidents. Very important, anytime you have a, a workplace accident, immediately notify your supervisor. Your supervisor should be able to review that situation and make necessary corrections if possible. Also let the safety department know. Maybe there's a situation where there's a wet floor. Safety department will be able to contact environmental services or if there's a situation with a lock that's not working, contact the environmental services team to get that situation corrected. It's very important you notify the safety department. Make sure you document your accident. Document all accidents. Go to the internet, complete the accident reporting form. If you're a Research Foundation employee, it will be sent to the Research Foundation uh, Human Resources Department. Volunteers, students, very important to document your accident. State employees have to notify workers' compensation by telephone. That information should be provided to, to you by your supervisor or contact human resources. So it's very important to document the accident and notify the workers' compensation fund so that you could be compensated for your, your injury. It's also, as again, important to notify the safety department so we can follow up and help investigate with your supervisor to not only prevent you from having that same accident, but to prevent other people here at NYPI from being injured in that same way. Now we talk about fire prevention. Smoke-free building, please no smoking. Do not leave any flames unattended. If you're a kitchen employee, make sure you're watching that food being cooked. If you're working in a laboratory, make sure you have a plan where you're monitoring that flame so you're not leaving that flame unattended to cause a potential fire. Do not block any corridors or exits with furniture, boxes, or any items. Do not block out sprinklers or fire extinguishers with furniture, equipment, so that those uh, emergency uh, fire safety devices could be accessed quickly. Do not hold open our fire doors. You know, our fire doors in this building are self-closing if the smoke detector is activated. So it's important that you don't leave anything uh, propped against it so that they can close to compartmentalize to prevent fire and smoke from spreading throughout the corridors. Same as the cold, make sure that you don't block any furniture, uh, excuse me, block our fire doors with furniture so that the fire doors can remain closed to keep smoke from spreading throughout the corridor. And of course, space heaters are not allowed on our inpatient units. If we do have a fire evacuation, first thing you wanna do is rescue anyone who's in immediate danger. You want to shout fire so that everyone in your area knows that there's a fire. You want to pull the alarm. Go to the nearest alarm. We have alarms by all the exits. Pull the alarm, and then you will have someone call 5555 and give you a name, exact location, and type of fire. Close the doors to the fire area to keep fire and smoke from 
penetrating beyond the smoke area and evacuate. Make sure that you use the stairs if necessary, never use the elevator, but by evacuating, it means line up by the nearest smoke apartment. Don't exit the building unless you feel unsafe and there's smoke going into your area. Just line up by the, close the doors and line up by the nearest exit until you hear uh, information from the safety department, the fire department, or, if, or unless of course you see fire or smoke and you feel unsafe, then evacuate down the stairs. Again, never use the elevator. If you're away from the fire, a lot of people think, oh, I'm not near the fire, I don't have to respond. Still, if you're away from the fire and you hear fire alarms or you hear an announcement, step outside of your offices, close the doors, and look, listen, and smell. Prepare to evacuate, because the situation could change and the fire or smoke can go to your work location. If we do have a total evacuation, it's a rare event, but if we do have a total evacuation, if you're in the parties building, which is at 1051 Riverside Drive, what you want to do is exit the building and assemble near the flagpoles on Riverside Drive. If you're in the cold building, which is 40 Haven, you want to exit the building and assemble in the parking lot in that circular driveway area by the School of Public Health to the right of the cold building. If you're in the patient units, you want to take the patients into the patient park and assist with a head count of the patients. We take the patients in the patient park so that they don't elope and we take them into that area and perform a head count. If you're physically challenged or you see someone physically challenged, what you should do is enter the stairwell and close the door and just notify the safety department of the exact location of the physically challenged person or yourself. That means if you're on the fifth floor by stairwell two, go into the stairwell two and let people know I'm in stairwell two, let the safety department know. If you have a cell phone, call 646-774-5555 and let safety department know. I'm in a stairwell, I couldn't evacuate. And what we've been trained to do is we'll notify the New York City Fire Department and they'll go to your location and they have the elevator key where they can take over an elevator and safely take you down or take the physically challenged person down. Or they come with enough staff they can actually carry you down the, st uh, the stairs. Now we'll talk about fire extinguishers. We have a fire extinguisher and what we use basically, most of the fire extinguishers are ABC extinguishers, which puts out wood fires, paper fires, cloth fires, oil, gasoline, electrical fires, ABC type extinguishers. And how you use an ABC extinguisher is that you remember the pass method. So what you would do is, if there's a fire, first you'd activate, you'd pull the alarm, call 5555, give your name, exact location, type of fire, and then you'd grab one of these ABC fire extinguishers. And then you would pull the pin. Your thumb is the strongest finger, so you want to use the th your thumb and you want to pull and twist. And after you've pulled and twist, you want to pull the pin you want to aim for the base of the fire. The base is usually the leading edge of the fire. You want to aim for the leading edge of a liquid fire. You want to aim for the base of a solid fire and a liquid fire. You want to aim for the base because the base is what's fueling the fire. So you want to pull the pin, aim. You want to squeeze these two levers together, and you want to sweep. So pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. You want to be about 8 to 10 feet from the fire if you have a fire with this ABC type of extinguisher. So you want to pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. Before you fight a fire, of course you want to, as I said, activate the alarm. Call 5555. So you want to pull the alarm, call 5555, notify the building occupants, and make sure help is on the way. Know what's burning, that's critical, because the wrong type of fire extinguisher can actually make the fire worse. We have other types of extinguishers. We have a Class D extinguisher, which I showed you a little earlier. Class D, which puts out combustible metal fires. Those fires, staff, lab staff are specially trained to use those. So if it's a metal fire, those staff have been trained to use the Class D fire extinguisher, which is this yellow fire extinguisher. We also have Class K fire extinguishers, which are kitchen fire extinguishers. Our kitchen staff are trained to use those Class K extinguishers, but they are trained to recognize if there's a kitchen fire, 
to grab the proper type of extinguisher. This extinguisher top with the round nozzle is our CO2 carbon dioxide extinguisher, which some of our maintenance staff and our safety staff have been trained to use these carbon dioxide extinguishers, which we use for electrical fires, liquid fires. And those extinguishers, you have to actually be about two or three inches from the fire. So it's actually used different, differently than our ABC extinguisher. So the key is to know what's burning. If you don't know what's burning, pull the ex alarm, call 5555, and get yourself to safety. The most important thing is pulling, calling 5555 and getting yourself to safety. But if you know what's burning, then use one of our extinguishers if you've been trained to use the extinguisher and feel comfortable using the extinguisher. So before you fight a fire, activate the alarm, call 5555, know what's burning, familiar with how the kitchen staff class, the D class is the lab safety staff who use that, and class K is, our, and the CO2 extinguisher, some of our maintenance and safety staff. So if you're not familiar with how to use those extinguishers, don't use the extinguisher. If you want specialized training, please call the safety department at 5100 and we'll set up an appointment and I'll be happy, me or one of my fellow safety officers will be more than happy to go to your work area and work with you on, and familiarize you, you on how to use the particular fire extinguisher in your area if you would like a special refresher course or one-to-one -one training. Also, make sure you have a way out. Don't try to put a fire out and if you don't have a way out, if you're trapped. If you don't have a way out, immediately get yourself to safety. And make sure the fire is small and easily controlled. These extinguishers are for very small fires. They're not for a large fire creating a lot of smoke. For that type of fire, you need the fire department who have uh, scuba gear, self-contained breathing apparatus. If you don't have uh, scuba gear that you can breathe oxygen tanks, do not try to put a large fire out. Just close the door and get yourself to safety. Now we'll talk briefly about interim life safety measures. If you see signage or an email that says interim life safety measures alert, please read the signage, open the email, because they will have information concerning your safety here at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Prior to construction uh, projects, we conduct risk assessments, and if we find anything that's compromises the building safety features, will notify staff and building occupants. Uh, a few years ago, there was uh, excavation and a 10-foot hole was dug right outside of stairwell two, which is in the parties building right in the atrium area. So we put a no exit sign to prevent staff from using that exit. So if you see no exit signs or signage of our interim life safety measures, please uh, read it and take note of any emails or signage that you see regarding building uh, safety features being compromised. Lastly, this is a hospital. If you see one of our patients abused, neglected in any way, please don't con hesitate to contact our risk manager, which is who's at extension 8250, or call the New York, City, uh, New York State Justice Center if you feel that uh, the patient is in danger and you want immediate uh, uh, safety, safeguarding of the patient, contact the New York State Justice Center if you don't feel comfortable contacting our uh, risk manager. Well, welcome to PI and please enjoy your stay here. Next up is Marshall who will set up uh, New York's NYSPI data security. All right, thank you, Chief, uh, for that and everything you do here. Um, so we spoke a little bit about our responsibility to protect patient uh, uh, data. It's also our responsibility to protect the systems that we keep our data on. Um, so we're going to play a... Um, In this the, video, we will be NISB going over the protection of data at NISB. Uh, ...recording, and I'll be back in a minute to talk to you more about policies. HIPAA regulates how we collect, use, and store data here at NISB. The goal of this presentation is to give you an understanding of the privacy and security rules put in place by HIPAA and also to provide you with the information about steps you can take to keep information secure. 
HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. The original law was enacted in 1996 and was intended to establish national standards for the protection of health information. Subsequent additions to the original law have been aimed at regulating the use of digital medical records. There are many components to HIPAA and the actual laws can be pretty complex. For our purposes, we will just be going over some specific components that directly affect how we operate at NISPE. This video is only intended to go over the most relevant aspects The first thing we will cover is privacy. Uh. Applies to protected health information, or PHI, created, used, or disclosed by a covered entity. The privacy rule establishes who is permitted to use, disclose, or access information. It also requires that only the minimum necessary information be used for any permitted action regarding PHI. These are some terms that you should be familiar with. The privacy rule protects all individually identifiable health information held or transmitted by a covered entity in any form or media. Individually identifiable health information is any health information for which there is a reasonable basis to believe it can be used to identify an individual. PHI is comprised of health information and personal identifiers that link it to a specific person. This is a list of common personal identifiers. If any of these are linked to health information, then it's protected health information. Health information that is not paired with any personal identifiers is considered de-identified and is not subject to HIPAA. Now let's look at the term covered entity. A CE is any organization that is subject to the privacy rules established by HIPAA. CEs can be healthcare providers like hospitals and pharmacies, they can be insurance related, or they could be something like an intermediary billing service. All students, interns, registered volunteers, staff paid by OMH, Columbia University, or RFMH, or others that work in some capacity under NISPE or OMH are considered part of the NISPE workforce and must comply with HIPAA regulations. A business associate is a person or organization that provides a service to a covered entity involving access to PHI. The privacy rule requires that a BA contract include specific safeguards in place to protect PHI. A business associate contract is not required for disclosures from a covered entity to a researcher as long as patient authorization has been obtained. A CE can use and disclose PHI for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations without written authorization. Any information disclosed must follow the minimum necessary rule, which states that the use of the minimum amount of information necessary to achieve the intended purpose. Research in NISPE requires a signed patient authorization or a waiver of authorization from the IRB. HIPAA is not the only thing to consider in terms of protecting patient information. There are also New York State and Columbia regulations that apply to specific situations. The ones listed here are just some examples of additional laws that protect patient confidentiality. Contact the HIPAA officer to find out specific laws regarding your specific research information. There are a few common sense measures that you can take to ensure the patient information is not accidentally or carelessly disclosed. Don't discuss PHI in a public place or with people you don't know, and don't use patient names in a public area. Don't leave labeled specimens unlocked or in a visible space. Limit access to areas where patient information is kept. Use only secure fax machines when sending PHI, and don't leave identifiable information on voicemail or an answering machine. Finally, if you have to send PHI, send it in a sealed envelope that doesn't include NISPE in the address. Now let's look at the security rule component of HIPAA. The convenience of electronic patient information comes with an increased risk for that, that personal information could be stolen or accidentally disclosed. In recognition of these risks, 
HIPAA included the security rule which applies to PHI stored or transferred on electronic devices. This is referred to as ePHI. It does not apply to written or oral patient information. The security rule requires an institution to have policies and procedures to manage the selection, development, implementation, and maintenance of security measures to protect ePHI. This includes administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. We're going to go over how we here at NISP comply with the security component of HIPAA. This section will also include some New York State required information security as well. Passwords are covered elsewhere in this video, so we can start at the physical safeguards. First, only authorized users should have physical access to NISP devices or personal devices that access PHI. Never leave a laptop or mobile device unattended. When traveling, any electronic device needs to be secure. Devices should never be in checked luggage. Users with mobile devices containing access or accessing PHI must make sure that data on the screen cannot be seen by unauthorized persons. Here's an example of how a small oversight in the security of a device containing PHI can create serious liabilities. In 2012, the Alaska DHHS had to pay $1.7 million for HIPAA violations after an employee's car is broken into and a single unencrypted USB device containing the ePHI of 2,000 individuals was taken. It's easy to think that something as small as a USB device doesn't present a huge security risk, but the reality of digital information means that every device needs to be used with caution. Small shortcuts like not taking 30 seconds to encrypt a portable hard drive is needlessly reckless when you consider the danger that it presents. In this case, the loss of the device led to a complete investigation into the DHHS. This leads us to the next section, the encryption of all devices. Encryption is a method of protecting data from people that you don't want to see it. While there are many methods of encryption, they work on the same fundamental principle. Data is scrambled using an algorithm and unscrambled with the use of an encryption key. Normal, unscrambled data is referred to as plain text, and encrypted data is referred to as ciphertext. Encryption is an effective way to keep data secure. It's also very easy to take the basic steps necessary to ensure that you are correctly encrypting any device you might be using. There's really no excuse for storing any plain text data, be it PHI or otherwise. Data security is generally broken down into two categories. Data at rest refers to an inactive data stored physically in any digital form. This includes things like databases, spreadsheets, or archives. Data in transit refers to data actively moving from one location to another, such as across the internet or through a network. Encryption is required for data at rest in regards to desktops that access or contain any state entity, personal or private or sensitive information, data stores containing PHI or NISP information, any mobile device, state issued or personal used to access any state entity information, and all portable devices containing state entity information. Encryption is required for any transmission of personal, private or sensitive information when connecting to the state internal network over a wireless network and re remotely accessing a state internal network. BitLock can be used for full disk encryption of Windows devices as well as the encryption of USB drives. BitLock is only available in Windows 10 Pro, Enterprise, or Education. Detailed instructions for the proper use of encryption can be found on the CIIT website. Mac users can also find information about how to use Fire File Vault 2 for encryption. iPhones and virtually all Android devices have built in encryption features. You need to check your phone settings to make sure you are taking full advantage of these features. Your phone should be password protected and set up to have screen lock after 5 minutes of inactivity. Your device should also be set up so that all data is wiped after 10 incorrect password attempts. There's more information regarding mobile device encryption on the CIIT website. If you have any issues with ensuring that your personal device is correctly encrypted, please contact the service desk. The loss or theft of any device containing NISP data must be reported immediately. A timely response to potential IT issues can be mitigated if it's caught early. Next, we'll be going over the secure use of email. 
NISP uses Office 365 as a secure email service for all its business. You should never use a personal email for anything involving PHI or any other NISP related business. You can encrypt emails in Outlook by including the hashtag encrypt in the subject line. You should also include this disclosure when sending PHI within an email. CIIT requires that all systems be registered. New York State IT standards require that a state entity like NISPE create a record of all systems and data contained within those systems. This means IT needs to be made aware of any database, mobile device application, or any other system that's used for NISPE business. You can find a link for registering your system on the CIIT website. You will be asked for all the information that's needed to comply with system registration policies in place for Columbia University and New York State. If you are developing a multi-user system that will be used for research, keep in mind that the data you store within that system will dictate the level of security that it requires. Part of system registration involves an assessment and classification of data. Anything containing PHI will need to abide by stringent security guidelines. You should only be storing essential information necessary to accomplish your research goals. The last part of HIPAA covered in this video will be the breach notification rule. A breach is a prohibited use or disclosure of unsecured PHI under the privacy rule that compromises the security or privacy of a PHI. Any breach is thoroughly investigated to determine the nature and extent of the information disclosed. Steps must be taken to minimize security risks, and all patients affected by the breach, regardless of the quantity, must be notified. Again, it's important that you uh, go to IT if you suspect any loss or theft of information. Media notice may be indicated if the breach involves more than 500 people. Federal government notification of breaches of more than 500 records must occur within 60 days of the breach, and a business associate must comply with the same rules and must notify a CE if a breach has occurred. There are specific penalties in place for failing to protect PHI. The penalty amounts are based on the level and intent of the breach. All accidents are classified and penalized according to their type. Examples include faxing or emailing a document, sending lab results to the wrong person, using PHI without proper security credentials, or failing to encrypt a mobile device. These are a few examples of how a breach might occur. Workforce members in NISPE are required to understand the privacy, security, and breach notification components of HIPAA. PHI and EPHI must be protected. PHI for research purposes requires an auth authorization from the IRB or a waiver of authorization. How we use and disclose information is outlined in the consent form. Remember that PHI can be used or disclosed for treatment purposes with a few constraints as long as the minimum necessary standard is met and we obtain patient's assent. If the patient objects, the provider must understand the actual limits on disclosure. Okay, so again, you should only be um, disclosing uh, on a need-to-know basis for the, re for the reasons of treatment, uh, billing, and um, operations. And um, it's everyone's responsibility to protect patient health information. For the next... Um, some of the protected characteristics here, uh, well, throughout the state are um, listed here. And everybody is a member of, you know, protected um, uh, classes, whether it's your, because of your age, your um, uh, gender, your uh, race, your religion. Um, all of us, uh, you know, want to work um, in a workplace free of discrimination. Um, so we have to offer that to one another. And it's, 
it's you know our personal responsibility to create a workforce um, and a workplace uh, that that is free of discrimination. So um, it's important that we know the protected characteristics and that we do our best to be as inclusive as possible. Um, there's also in the PDFs uh, that we sent you. Uh, there was also um, a sexual uh, harassment and an equal employment opportunity. And equal employment opportunity talks about workplace discrimination. And of course, the sexual harassment uh, spoke specifically about um, sexual harassment in the workplace. But any, um, uh, you know, if it involves any protected characteristic, it, it's unlawful if it's severe or pervasive enough, uh, the harassment in the workplace. It's actually illegal. Um, and the state of New York has a 0% tolerance policy, which means that we don't have to wait for it to become uh, unlawful before we speak with somebody about it. Um, so we do encourage people to report if they see any discrimination in um, their work area. And uh, the, the state of New York also uh, encourages people to report um, uh, to the affirmative action officer. And currently the affirmative action officer uh, in the governor's office of employee relations is Michael McCann. And you can um, you know, send the email to him, uh, you know, speak with your supervisors. Uh, but um, you know, we, we would like for people to report um, if they do see discrimination. Again, we wanna create a workplace that's free of discrimination. Um, uh, for all of us, for everyone. Um, and um, some of the things you need to know are that um, anyone can be a victim or perpetrator. It can be a contractor, volunteer. It doesn't have to uh, necessarily be an employee, but anyone involved in the workplace can be a victim or perpetrator. It also can happen anywhere. It can happen off-site, a supervisor's house, uh, um, you know, at a party on Friday night, as long as it, again, involves people in the workplace uh, and it had, has to do with work, it can be considered sexual um, uh, harassment uh, or workplace harassment due to any protected characteristic. And supervisors and managers, you know, um, they also, uh, if someone reports to you that they've seen it, even if they say they don't want to report it, it's your responsibility um, uh, to report it. Um, you know, to the affirmative action officer. Um, there were also reasonable accommodations PDFs sent out. Um, one covered our, re our responsibility to uh, provide accommodations for the public. We wanna be able to serve everyone and that includes uh, with service animals. Uh, we do what we can to make sure that, you know, we're providing the same service to, to all um, uh, of the public. And also for supervisors and staff, we, if we need an accommodation to be able to do our jobs, uh, we're allowed to request that too in our workplace. And then um, religion uh, talks about, you know, if you have, if you wanna wear something different or you need to, to do something different because of your religion, um, then you know you need to speak with your supervisor about that and they um, are responsible to do the best that they can to accommodate you as well. Uh, the internal controls PDF that we had sent you uh, talks about you know five different components of sort of working in um, creating a safer workplace what we've been talking about all along and some of the things that you know we do is like the of course the agency is uh, constantly creating goals um, uh, to make make the place safer and policies and the required skills of, of staff and training and safety standards and then we do risk assessment of course we can accept avoid or or uh, share or mitigate a uh, risk and then control activities can be you know locks cameras keeping information out of sight and um, um, information and communication through meetings emails and signs to um, make the place safer and then also monitoring risk through supervision case reviews internal and external audits uh, those are the things that we do our, our best to, to help to make sure that we're um, continuously becoming a safer place to work and uh, language access Governor Cuomo signed executive order number 26 a while ago stating that um, you know all uh, people getting state funding have to be able to provide uh, language access uh, to the people that we serve. So we um, have a phone interpreter. It's a 24 seven, 24 hour, seven day a week service where you can uh, access an interpreter. And uh, those numbers are on the phones and the units on the safety desk. Uh, if you need interpreter for the people that you serve, uh, then you can call us at, at staff development as well. And our number will be at the end. 
Um, also, we have a volunteer language bank too. Uh, if you need a person, if you need somebody in person, uh, we do have, um, and those people are on site that, at that time, uh, we do have um, volunteer interpreters here that work here. And a document translation and phone interpretation services are also available. Um, so, um, you know, that's what we do to serve people that have limited English. And it is our responsibility. If someone comes up to you speaking in a language that you don't know, um, you should bring them to the safety desk and the safety desk can help you by calling uh, for a phone interpreter. And we'll be able to figure out uh, what that person needs. Um, and the code of ethics is, uh, uh, you know, another one of the PDFs that, that was sent out. And it really talks about um, how we need to work. You know, everybody working here or volunteering here represents this agency, and we really need to work with, um, you know, impartiality, confidentiality, and we have to be a steward of the the, the public resources that we're given. Um, you know, as said in the video, we receive a lot of public funds um, in, in order to do the jobs that we're doing. So we want to make sure that we're we're using those fairly and with integrity and avoiding any conflicts of interest. Also, um, our respect policy was, you know, among the PDFs that we sent out with esteem or honor expressing of of relating to others with a regard and consideration of attention and civility as uh, uh, visitors, coworkers, collaterals, and while representing NISPI. And respectful and courteous behavior should be evidenced in all work-related interactions and communications. And, you know, the, for the most part, you know, everybody does a really good job of that here, and we just want to make sure that that continues. Uh, also, the gender identity uh, toolkit was sent out uh, by uh, the state of New York, and we, you know, we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to review it. It was sent in with the PDFs uh, that you received before you watch this video, and you know, really look at it closely. Um, and it's expected of of supervisors, especially, to understand this. And you know, um, what what are some things that we are not supposed to do? Uh, is you know, force an individual to discuss or explain any any um, transition. Uh, in their gender with other employees or continuing to intentionally refer to an individual using a different name or pronoun than um, they they want to or you know forcing an employee to act in any way inconsistent with their um, identity um, so those are some important things to know and you know another way like I said we all want to work in a respectful environment an environment that's respectful of our culture so you know we want to make sure that we are in turn uh, being respectful of everybody and their cultures um, also some of the um, institute policies where the employee conduct work rules and employee patient relations uh, of course you know with employee patient relations uh, we want to make sure, again, that we're treating patients with respect. We're doing the best that we can to help them. That's what we're here for. And, you know, we're not um, uh, doing anything like, you know, um, uh, to enhance our own personal relationships, uh, whether business or um, uh, personal. And, you know, those are those are things that, that we are not supposed to do in that employee-patient relations um, uh, rules policy was also uh, sent out and fall reduction in response to patient condition uh, for fall reduction you know just for the general staff uh, the, you know the chief talks about being safe and you know making sure that you're wearing safe footwear reporting any any areas where there might be slips and falls um, in the patient areas there's a there's a fall re uh, um, risk form that you would um, fill out for patient for any patient that's a fall risk, uh, so that you know the staff could be watching them and be aware of that. Uh, response to patient condition, y y you you know have to know the baseline of your patient, and you have to be able to um, tell when there are changes and make sure you're reporting those changes to the team, uh, um, so that you know they can respond appropriately. And this is also important for even support staff on the on the unit if. You've seen a patient walking around, you know, pacing in the hall, and then all of a sudden they're crouched in the corner. Um, you you need to, you know, let the um, clinical staff uh, know that and be aware that, you know, they might want to look in or check in on that patient, um, even as as a support person. So we all want to be here together, helping um, uh, to work to make sure uh, patients are are doing well. So. Uh, the, the Medicaid PDF, you know, it basically talks about um, program oversight and making sure that, you know, we're correcting any errors that we see 
um, uh, uh, you know, that mistakes can happen, but if they continue to happen, it, it starts to look like additional um, errors. Um, so we want to make sure that we're working with our oversight agencies, um, and that's not just with Medicaid, but in any oversight agency that you might have, in order to um, you know fix things right away when when we see them. Um, in the labs, and uh, you, you should contact um, Mateus Quick because there's, depending on the lab that you're working in, there are different safety trainings that you need to take. So um, you can uh, email or uh, call Mateus Quick. He's our right to know officer, and he's also um, the person that teaches lab safety here at um, uh, NISPE. So, um, you know, if you work in a lab, please contact him um, and he will discuss with you uh, the, the safety trainings that you need for in your particular area. Uh, there are also educational benefits and, and career development for different people. So, uh, you know, everything from uh, being able to take civil service exams uh, to uh, looking into uh, tuition assistance programs, uh, we do our best to, to try to help people to de develop their careers here. So um, you can give us a call. Uh, you know, our, our number is 646-774-8261 uh, or 8262. Uh, you could call either one and, um, you know, we can help you out in that area or any other questions that you have. So um, you can call us uh, to get your safety card. And um, uh, thank you uh, very much and, and welcome uh, to uh, New York State Psychiatric Institute. And we hope to see you around and stay safe.